Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the ball. Welcome along, everybody, to the latest episode of the RTE GAA podcast. We're going to chat football with Eamon Fitzmaurice very shortly. But Shane Dowling is with myself and Rory to talk about hurling. No better place to start than the Munster Championship. And it feels like, Shane, this is the weekend that is going to decide everything, isn't it? Yeah, it's not. I won't say what's gone up to now is going to be not remembered, because if you're from Waterford, you're certainly going to remember it. But for all the other four counties... It's uh, listen, and it's gas like you know, because the only team that can be knocked out of the Munster Championship this weekend is Limerick. <laughs> uh, and like if you said that five weeks ago, people would be marching straight into 5B, probably, and telling you that you're mad because they, right. you, you just couldn't see that being the case. But and it's not like that's not something that is, is a million miles away from the possibility as well. Like, because I mean, Clare played last weekend, Cork are coming in fresh, so they could very easily go to Cusick Park and get a win. And what a game is going to be in Turles then because. Uh, like I think Tipperary had a taste of what they need to get up to when they played Limerick in the league semi final, and the league is a league, and we all know, you know, the the improvements that most teams have made coming out of it. But uh, it will just be, I think Tipperary get a sense of they know what's required, and it's gas. Like over the last couple of years, Liam Cahill has beaten everybody. Um, the only person he still has to beat is John Kiley. That's mm-hmm. going back to the COVID year, Munster Championship, All Ireland Championships. He's really proven himself to be a top class manager. Not even this year, or last year. He's done it since he was with Tipperary in the minors. But I mean, you need a burning desire on the pitch from the players. You need it on the sideline as well. And I'd say Liam Cahill is sick of looking at John Kiley at this stage, and he really wants to get one over him <laughs> on a personal level, but obviously for the county of Tipperary as well. So. Um, the only thing I'd say, Jackie, and I know we might always complain that, that we're never happy, is you'd love to, uh, you'd love if one was on a Saturday evening and one was on a Sunday so you could get to both games. Um, because there's a lot of neutrals out there that would have, like, I would have certainly went to Ennis, um, even if it was m- m- might be the best option for me to go down to Ennis now, but I'd have went down there <laughs> uh, the and uh, and I'd have went off to Thurles in the you'd Sunday. You'd have to have a hat on, Shane, would you? Yeah, hat, yeah, yeah. Sunday. Anyway, listen, e- either way, it's um. As a hurling person, we certainly can't give out this weekend anyway. Yeah. Come here. What's going on in Limerick? Because there's talk of, you know, difficulties in the panel. And like I, I think this just comes with the pressure of the situation that's involved. But I can't remember a week like this where there's been so many rumours coming out about different players departing and different rows going on. So give us the inside track. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on now, Jackie. What's going on is that you probably have three to four really sad individuals that are stuck in a room of four walls and the blinds down and bored <laughs> and thinking, what can I do to get myself traction this week to pass some time? And unfortunately, people have bought in to what them losers have had to do because like social media, you know, it is the devil like on so many occasions. I'll tell you where it's positive. It's positive that we see that, you know, it, we, we all saw the incident probably of that poor misfortune of the country that got a bit of a, a, a bit of a beat, right? And that highlights, right, the, the individuals that are there. It can be positive in so many ways, right? It can, it can bring a positive influence and, and, and an outcome on so many things. And even though I would say that particular incident was just disgusting, right? It, mm. it, it will highlight them individuals and it will bring, uh, you know, justice to everybody. When it comes to... Uh, negative stuff there's way more negative stuff that comes out of it and this is one I mean like you know if you're John Kiley, uh, you know this week you're probably delighted and I'll tell you why because when you're all Ireland champions for three years in a row and people are telling you you're brilliant and you can't be beaten at times you need something Jackie right and Limerick are very process driven as are most other counties but sometimes you need emotion as well and I think, you know, Limerick will, 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 they won't, they will certainly have a bit of emotion this week. And it's great for John and the players to go around and say, we see now that everybody against us, this is what's going on. There is only one way to put, to put this thing to bed. And I think that's what's going to happen because, um, you know, as, as far as I'm aware, Jackie, there is absolutely nothing going on uh, at all. And it's just sad, I suppose, to see what's happened. And Listen, of course, again, I'm from Nimerick. Sure, people can throw whatever commentary they want around it. But it's in any other, if that happened in any other county, it's, uh, listen, it's, it's just what people do in this day and age. And we just have to get on with it. Mm. It does seem there's a different kind of spotlight on them, though, Rory, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, but they're, they, they're, they're 
three in a row defending all Ireland champions. There were, you know, like spotlight, I suppose, comes with the territory. And I think, in fairness to Limerick, since they started this amazing journey, was it five years ago, in terms of the success that they've been on, they've handled the media really well. They've always done a really good job. I think, by and large, what I, the sense I get anyway, and a few times that I've been involved in either interviewing or doing stuff with Limerick players, they're very articulate, they're quite clever, they're there's good personality about a lot of them. I think they're very good ambassadors for the game. And I think a lot of the stuff that we do see on social media, I think Shane is right. I think Don Logue once described it as it's like the scrawl on the back of a toilet wall. You remember when we were kids in school and that's effectively what social media is. That's how low it is. And I don't necessarily see any major disruptions to their preparation this Sunday bar injuries. And I do, I do think Sean Finn is a significant one. I think to a degree, look, I, under, I totally accept they have incredible cover, but I do think he's special and his character is special and he, like, he's the best defender in the country for the last, I, well, I, I, I haven't, you're probably going back to JJ Delaney to try and find a better one since Sean Finn. So I think that is significant. We don't know what the story is with Keane Lynch. I'd imagine he's going to play and I'm sure Declan Hannon will be fine. But by that that accepting, I think Limerick will probably be picking from near enough to a full hand, as will Tipperary minus Jason Ford. So maybe that cancels, one cancels out the other. So yeah, I'm expecting rock and roll Sunday. I can't wait for this one. Can't wait for it. Yeah, me too. I was actually going to ask you that, Shane. Does Jason Ford cancel out Sean Finn? Because they're both so crucial to both teams. Uh, I would probably say it's a bigger blow for Tipperary because as Rory rightly said, like Limerick have got fantastic cover um, and they have a bigger squad depth than probably the most in the most other teams in the country. Uh, and like Jason Ford is just a deadly forward. Like, and we've seen the one thing that Liam Cahill's teams do is they go for goals. Uh, they've done it in every game this year with the acceptance of, of Limerick in the league semi-final. Um, like Mike Casey could just slip in there for Sean if they push, you know, who's to say, are they to put Kyle Hayes up to, up, up to centre forward, maybe push Dan Marcy to wing back and have both Rich English and Mike Casey in. Like, as Rory said, either way, he's a massive loss. Like, he is the best defender in the country. Uh, and, you know, there's no getting away from that. But I just think a Tipperary team with Jason Ford not in it, or a Limerick team with Sean Finn not in it, I think you'd be more upset if you were from Tipperary because just even the free taking ability, like yeah. I know the tip of other free takers yeah. there and everything else, but I have to say, like Jason Ford's free taking over the last couple of years has been just unerring. Like he's been really, really good. And I mean, you're there with 20 minutes to go, a draw game, packed hurlis. You need somebody with a bit of experience taking frees and that has done it time in, time out over the last couple of years. And like, while Garota Connor is a fantastic free taker, he hasn't done that, you know what I mean? And, and Jason Ford has. So even from that element alone, I think probably Jason Ford is a bit of a bigger loss than Sean Finn is to Limerick for this game. Mm. Yeah, look, that that's interesting how that plays out. I do think the other big thing, Rory, is how Tipperary handled this because it's a massive opportunity for them. Like they know if they can take out the All-Ireland champions, their own passage to a Munster final and beyond is there for them as well. If, you, if Tipperary were offered that chance at the start of the year, given where they've come from, they would have snatched the hand off to be in this position. Absolutely. And they're building momentum and they're building it game by game. I obviously watched back the Cork tip game uh, a second time um, like two nights ago. And there was a sort of a narrative spun out afterwards that they, f they would have felt disappointed that they left that game after them. I'm not so sure about that. Um, they, I think there was... I caught like they, they were they were five points up on a couple of occasions heading into the main, the main thrust of the second half, but there was two scores. There was one chap, a really good friend of mine, who was in the upper south stand, and he said one of them was about two foot wide, and definitely the other one was questionable. There was a ball, like Shane. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can you grab the slitter out of someone's hand? No, but you can't take nine steps, either, Rory. <laughs> in what in what sense, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, no, the point I'm making is this, right? So if you look like the Owen Downey was scorer, was it Rob Downey was coming out with the ball and Jake Morris just ripped the ball out of his hand. Now, the Cork players stopped, right? Which I thought was a stupid thing to do in its own, right? And Jake Morris put the ball over the bar and potted the wire wave play on. And then he blew Shane Kingston on another on another occasion for um for over carrying when you could clearly see he'd played the ball off the hurley and he that was a point that was disallowed. 
Uh, so, Rory, one second, no, one second, no, but for, for, um, for Robbie Flynn's goal, no, he took about nine steps. Absolutely. So, like, you can absolutely. go through the game, but, you can go Yeah, you can yeah go. But, but, but the point I'm making is this, sorry, and it was a long-winded way, and I apologise for that, and I don't want anyone to be thinking, look, this is a sort of a cock bias. I don't necessarily buy the fact that they would they left the game after them. I don't even think Cork played that well and still managed to pull out a draw and they are leaking goals. So they'll have their concerns going in on Sunday and I think it's a really good opportunity for Limerick to just get the horse back on track. Like, look, the reality from a Limerick point of view, everyone is wringing their hands. They lost the match by a point and it was the first game they've lost in four years. There's no panic. and But it, it will be, I do believe it is a 50-50 contest on Sunday. And I think, Jackie, just for like for anyone that is going to it or is watching in like that, knowing Paul Canork like I know him, right? Like the Limerick players may have taken a week off. Uh, I'd say he hasn't taken a second off. Uh, <laughs> that will be annoying him now that the perception out there is that teams know how to turn over Limerick. I think Limerick are going to come with something different this Sunday. I don't know what it is, but I think they're going to come with something different. And uh, what Rory said there about Tipperary leaking goals, what was really interesting in the, in the league semi-final, I know I'm referencing a bit, but... Limerick got no opportunity for the goal. The only goal they got was Peter Casey, and that came from a mishit shot out the field to drop short. So it was funny how White Tipperary have leaked a load of goals in the championship, not so much in the league, but there's one thing Limerick will be going after this week is that how can we do what other teams have done in getting them goals, while Liam Cahill and Mikey Beavins will be saying, right, we have now leaked enough goals, we need to stop this. So it'll be interesting to see what happens or who comes out top on that side of it. Yeah, great cat and mouse in that one. What about Cork Clare then, lads? Because, like Rory, you're right. Cork maybe didn't play to their optimal play well levels against Tipperary. But I think people have seen enough of what Pat Ryan is doing with this team to be optimistic that they can pull out a result here and that this Cork team maybe are going in the right direction, particularly given the under-20 success and everything that's happening as well. I think there's a positivity there. There is a positivity. And I think the biggest positivity is the fact that the team are prepared to go down swinging. I think, look, you, any any supporter in any county, the only thing that they will expect from their team is to just go down fighting. Don't ever throw the white, don't ever throw the towel in and just go right to the full-time whistle. And on a couple of occasions, the Cork hurlers have let the Cork public down over the last 10 years. That is definitely not going to happen under Pat Ryan's watch. If Clare are going to win this game on Sunday, and I think they might, right? If Clare are going to win it, they're going to have to earn it. How? Because, like, I guess that's the big thing. There's still question marks about Clare as well. Yes, there's absolutely positivity there. How do you see them winning it? For me, Jack? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, 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 I just think from Clare's perspective, they like they will, the home advantage is key. Cork's record in Ennis isn't particularly good. I think that will definitely play into it, I'll, even though I think Cork are bringing seven, 8,000 up there and the tickets were snapped out and obviously sold out. So look, it'll be a raucous atmosphere from both sets of supporters. So there should be plenty, plenty of support on that side of it. I do think Clare will bring an abrasive nature. The perception again is still out there. Cork are soft, which I obviously think is a load of BS. But the, that will be definitely something that Claire will look to play on. They will probably try and be very, very physical early on. But that's not to, to belie the fact that Claire have some incredible hurlers. I think they've Cork have some big questions to ask. Personally, I'd start Tim O'Mahony at centre forward and look to try and take John Conlon on a tour. I think John Con John Conlon and Tony Kelly are going to be absolutely key. Who Cork put on Tony Kelly? I imagine it's going to be Millerick. I think he's the one player that might have the smarts and the mobility to stay with him. And then from a centre forwards perspective, I would definitely be starting Tim O'Mahony on this because I think he'll give John Conlon something to think about that John Conlon might find a little bit awkward. But I think if you can win those two battles, and that's a big, big if now. I think you've given yourself a really good platform maybe for your dainty forwards to, to, to rack up a big enough score to maybe get out with a really, really good win. But I wouldn't be, a, I would be, I, I would not be confident. I'd be more hopeful than confident. Yeah. What about you, Shane? What, what do you see are the key areas there? I don't know about the key areas, but I think, uh, I think it's probably a bit too soon to be going on about under Pat Ryan and Pat Ryan's era and what Pat Ryan will do. Because the funny thing is here is like if they go down to Clare and lose the weekend, uh, well then Limerick have a chance to knock them out of the championship. And it's like it's uh, you know then all of a sudden this was wrong and that's wrong. Same old Cork. It's 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 way too soon to be to be to be 
I suppose saying exactly how it is. It's the same with Clare. I mean, if Corco and uh, and B Clare and Limerick win their next two, it, Clare wrote right. So it it there's it's it's way too early to be going on about anything in relation to any years. Like you know, the perception about Cork being soft is BS, as Rory says. That'll only tell us in the next two weeks whether it's BS or not. Because I mean, whether you know whether they're soft or not is can they go down to Ennis and get a win, or can they turn over the All Ireland champions in their backyard? That's where you'll be judged on how good a team that, that you are. And only the next two weeks is going to tell us that. Like, and, and it's the same with Clare. Like, Clare hurling is on a really, really big high, if that's what you want to call it. I mean, they're minors, they're twenties, they're seniors, they're all flying. Everything in Clare hurling is going really, really well. But in two weeks' time, they might get out of Munster, and all of a sudden, people will be wondering what the hell is going on as well. So, I think it's very early to be people complimenting each other. Now could be a dangerous road to go down because in a couple of weeks' time, it's like everything. When you win, everything is fine. But when you lose, everyone is looking to the to the millimeter of what's going wrong. Uh, you saying that there's no change in this. Uh, like if, if Claire get out Brian Lohan simple way of hurling it's great to see great fella and then if they don't get out of Munster it'll be a case of uh, oh, you know man. not tactically aware do, do you know not... the only thing is though Shane Brian Lohan hasn't really had a full deck to choose from over the time either like that is one crucial thing that finally now he's actually like great everyone's everyone's here I can actually pick and like in fairness to him he hasn't had that and maybe we're actually finally starting to see what he can do with a team when he has a full deck to choose from Possibly. The only thing I'd say there does you probably travel a long way around the country to find a team that has had a full sure. deck over the last sure. couple of years as well. So everyone is always on one or two. It's the nature of the way the sport has gone. It's so intense, it's so physical. Uh players get injured. But I do hear you. Listen, Brian Lone has done an exceptional job in Claire. Don't get me wrong. And credit must go to him, right? Especially considering that I don't think they wanted to give it to him in the first place or whatever the hell was going on there a couple of years ago. But um so listen, all I'm saying is Claire, Claire Cork, one of them may not get out of Munster yet. And if that's the case, then all the, the positivity and the compliments that are going around will change in a couple of weeks. What do I think is going to happen on Sunday? Uh, I actually said, initially, I was doing a Munster preview night down in the Valley Rovers in front of Cork people and boldly predicted that Cork would not get out of Munster. So you can imagine... That, that went down well. In that went down very well, as you can imagine, right? Uh, my reason being is, you know, Pat Ryan's first year... Uh, and I just defer. I think they're an ex- I, I genuinely think Cork are fantastic hurling county. They have some exceptional players and have had over the years. It's actually, a great time for them. But again, and the perception that maybe it's not a perception, Rory, maybe, maybe it's factual. Over the last long number of years, that bit of like, as you said, all you want is players to go down swinging, go down fighting. That hasn't happened in Cork in the last couple of years. Yeah. And it's only when that happens, I can say, yeah, well, fair enough. No Cork have the hurlers but they've also got a shower of dogs inside in that squad as well that are going to pull them over the line. So, uh, but again, a win on a win on, a win win on on Sunday for me, irrelevant to what happens in the Gaelic Crowns, because that's a hard ask coming down to beat Limerick in the Gaelic Crowns. But a win on Sunday for me for Cork and down to Clare would be massive. Clare now, they, they're playing two weeks in a row. Like that first half against Waterford, I was down at it. I know they won easy in, in the finish, but that first half was, was very physical. It was cat and mouse. So like it would have taken a bit out of them but they done it. Uh, they done it against Limerick, where they did a game the previous week against Tipperary. So that's not going to be an excuse for them. Uh, I, I, I honestly can't call it. It's impossible to call. And anybody, Jackie, that calls this game with great confidence is definitely lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. And do you know what, Rory? It, it, mm. it only shows you further with the Munster Championship. Like when you look at what's going on in Leinster this weekend, compared to the everything that's on the line, like what Shane is talking about, I suppose it just shows still, I know we talk about this all the time, but the contrast of the two championships and what we're going to see in Munster this weekend versus what, I suppose Dublin Kilkenny aside, what we're going to get in Leinster. It's unbelievable. Like I'd say, I'd say the Munster Council, you know that? Do you ever see those gifts where they're making it rain? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say there's someone inside the Munster Council offices now and literally, I mean, printing, printing money. But like, but it's just, it's, it's, it's been a brilliant championship again. And it's all, it always delivers. I mean, there are years and certainly since the round Robin came in where there might be a couple of dead rubbers at the back end where one team or another, and that might even happen this year. It may even happen this year, but just the competitive nature, the crowds, the color, the story, the drama, everything about it has just been, you know, just something really to savor and i think this really is the key weekend this weekend because we'll definitely know quite no look the chances are if you, if the two home teams win it'll all go down to the final weekend tipperary you would imagine would be 
um, home and host at that stage, and like, or sorry, if the two favourites win, which is Clare and Limerick, and then Tipperary with Waterford in the in the pocket last day, not much to play for. So you'd imagine in that scenario, the real game then really is whether or not Cork can turn Limerick over in the Gaelic grounds, which would be quite the task. But I think, look, from the, from the get go, it's just been an unbelievable championship, and uh, yeah, look, I can't wait now for Sunday, at two o'clock, four o'clock. I mean, you know, what what more could you ask for? Yeah, uh, a good place on a couch, sitting down, or being yeah, at one of the yeah. venues, I would say. Yeah. Is I can't get a ticket. I can't. You can't even get a ticket for. I know. You know. Yeah, it's wild. I have a lot of friends in the same boat. What about Leinster then, Shane? Because okay, I guess. It has been a bit of a counter so far for Kilkenny and Galway. You look at them and you can kind of already say, OK, Graham, look, there's your Leinster final pairing. What about Dublin? Is there any chance of them? I, I suppose their passage to the knockout stage is already kind of looking fairly secure. But what about them against Kilkenny this weekend? What sort of a, a challenge is that, I guess? And can you see them going after this game and trying to get something out of it? Or, or how would you set up? Uh, just to go back to your initial question about Leinster, Jackie, and, and Aurora today, but everything is so different, the colour, the atmosphere, the intensity, all that. But, I mean, that comes on the pitch, first of all. I mean, you go back just, if you go back to last week for a second, to Dublin and to Wexford. I mean, like I, I actually don't care about teams in 50 wides. When I say I don't care about teams in 50 wides, right, that can just, an off day, that can happen, right? Teams are shooting, whatever. There's two things I'd ask there is, how in God's name did Dublin leave them get 50 shots off? That's the first thing you have to ask, right? Because yeah. they were obviously not any, anywhere near championship intensity to try and get any sort of pressure put on so that they weren't taking shots. That's the first thing. And the second thing is there was lads receiving balls and literally just trotting up the field beside what to do with it. Like, I just, I don't get it. I just don't get it, right? Whether teams know that, like, and okay, and even to go back a step, right? Like, Dublin and Wexford both know they're fighting for one spot. That's the reality of it. So for, for no other reason because of that, for that game last weekend, they should have been absolutely poking the heads off each other to try and, and get over the line. I was just so amazed that that wasn't there. And actually, underneath it all, I think Wexford are actually a good hurling side. If you go through, I, I, and come, I, I know they're missing bodies, I get that as well, right? But like they have come from uh, winning Leinster's, should have been in an All-Ireland final in nineteen to being so poor in the last year or two. So I don't know what's going on down there. It's, you know, Dar Egan said afterwards that, you know, the destiny is still in their own hands. It is if they want to win a couple of massive games, which nobody sees, sees them doing. So uh, I just can't put my finger on it. I, I, fair enough if the crowds aren't there. Fair enough if the colour isn't there. But there's no reason that between the four lines that teams aren't just doing. I won't say similar to what Munster teams are doing, but they, these are games that must win games to stay in the championship. And it's just not there. This weekend, I mean, how could anybody see Dublin beating Kilkenny on the back of what we've seen? They were, again, really poor in the league. Okay, it is what it is. But last weekend, they were so poor. And they, like, they, they had no challenge against, against Wexford at all. Like So the one the one thing we all know with Kilkenny is that you won't get time in the ball with them. I mean, if they're lacking in, in anything, the one thing they're never lacking in is that everything that we spoke about, that doggedness, you know, the intensity. So... Um, yeah, I, it's impossible to see Dublin get a result here. I mean, first year for Michal Dunn, who be, it was a it was a big win against Wexford. It wasn't a good win; it was a big win. It was a must win for one of the teams. Uh, I don't know how anybody could see Dublin turn over to Kenny this weekend. Both Dublin and Wexford. The reason the Leinster Championship is so poor is because Dublin and Wexford have been so poor. What was it a couple of years ago? Do you remember? It went down to the last game, the last puck. There were split screens on the television. It was like yeah. soccer Saturday, where it was going from one ground to the other. Nobody knew who was going to qualify. The re and that was brilliant. That was unbelievable. That was better. The Galway, the Galway go out on points difference. I think yeah, I well, finished yeah. on five points. I think. Yeah. yeah. But my point is, is that. That Leinster Championship was better than the Munster Championship that year. The reason being is you had four quality teams fighting for three places. So similar to Munster at the minute, where you have five fighting for three, right? The fact that Dublin and Wexford have slipped and gone back so much, that's why the Leinster Championship is so poor. Kilkenny and Galway, yeah, their games haven't been hectic either. But again, maybe deep down the players know, well, we don't have to be hectic because we're still going to be in the all Ireland series. Yeah. See, the difficulty is, Rory, no more than with Waterford, when a, a team that were making great progress starts to go backwards, it's actually not good for hurling generally to Donald Logue's point about visibility and all that. Like you can't have situations where suddenly Wexford fall off a cliff. Dublin are, are not making progress. As Shane says, Waterford are not making progress. It doesn't help the game. No, it definitely does not. But um, there are some green shoots 
Um, and I think it is worth mentioning, you, you, you know, we've seen Offaly obviously fall all the way down to Christy Ring. Um, they, they were in a minor final last year with largely the same players. They've won, won a Leinster Championship, I think, for the first time in uh, like an awful long time um, last night in an absolute thriller. It was a fantastic match in front of a full house in Dr. Cullen Park. It's incredible, like an underage game to get such a crowd like that. And it shows the thirst actually within Offaly to try and get back to the top table. And it would be fantastic. If we That'd could get brilliant. them, if we could get Offaly back up there to compete and get back into Leinster, and I think they're the kind. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know what I loved about them last night, Jackie? And I know we're digressing a small bit, but I do think it's worth mentioning. They're an Offaly team playing a real Offaly brand of hurling. Like they're, it, it, it's 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 like a it's like a voodoo type hurling. Like it's just the way they play it. It's the, it's, it, like even the young lad Screeny, you know, like just his. It's just a magic touch. First touch, so sharp, so sweet. You know, they can do little different things in terms of the way the styles, even the way they hold the hurlies, the little hooks and blocks, the type, the type of, you know, the application on those. I, I just, I find, like, I find, I found last night really heartwarming from a hurling perspective because it kind of gave me the sense that I thought the young lad Adam Screeny spoke really well afterwards to get off the hurling back up to where it belongs. And I think that's a real shot in the arm for hurling in general. We all remember the nineties was my favorite time in hurling, you know, and how important that was. And um, I think, look, there are green shoots, but I think from the GA's perspective and exactly as you just said, Jackie, to go back to Don Logue's point, there's a really key aspect here within the next tranche. The next tranche of hurling counties are all of a similar level, but they're all very geographically similar as well. And they're all Leinster, Leash, Carlo, Westmead, Kildare, Offaly. Right. So there's five counties in a very, very small geographical area. Surely there's something, some sort of a plan to target that particular area and blanket bomb it in some way in an investment sense, because these teams aren't a million miles away and you're starting with a really good base there. I, you know, I, I think that to go back to your question and to, for Don Logue's point, that to me would seem like the obvious starting strategy for anybody in the governing body looking to start uh, some sort of a policy around, well, how do we get eight, nine teams up to 12? Well, well, if you've got three or four, all basically neighbours and all really at a good level, reasonably good level, Joe Mack level already, well, maybe maybe we go in and we blanket bomb that with lots of, lots of coaching, lots of money, lots of investment, because that's the biggest problem in hurling. Biggest problem in hurling, as somebody who's at the coal face and at the ground level, biggest issue, Jackie, is coaching, expertise in coaching. Hurling is harder to coach, harder to play, harder to fund. Coaching, coach, coaching is hard. Like you, I, I see it all the time. You have kids out there and they're being coached by somebody who's never picked up a hurley in their entire lives. But there's there's no one else to do it. You know what I mean? Well, and yeah. you say, do you remember... The Munster, and it's hard to go back now, but last night I was watching it as well, and it was brilliant to see. Mm. And it just brought me back to 2011. I don't know if you remember this. The Munster under 21 final in the Gaelic Grounds that went to extra time, Aidan Walsh. Aidan Walsh, Aidan Walsh. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Play, right? yeah, yeah. In 2009, Limerick were beaten by about 200 points in the All Ireland semi final. In 2010, there was a strike in Limerick. Yeah. Right? In 2011, there was a massive crowd at a Munster under 21 final. After extra time and Limerick won it, it was an incredible game with a big crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Limerick had, had no success for a long time prior to that, right? Beaten by Galway in the All Ireland semi final, fair enough. But 2013, both Limerick and Cork played a Munster senior uh, final uh, in the Gaelic Grounds. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of them players that were on the 21s team played in that Munster final. My point here is that that is a great starting point for teams because. As I said, it brought me back to then that when we had, we were, I won't say Limerick was an awfully back in 2011, but it was it was the same. We had no success. There was things weren't going good in Limerick and we were trying to build. And Offaly have now built with Wexford last night. And you'd love to see that in two, three, four years time, a lot of them players are playing senior for Offaly and competing at, I'm not saying Leinster finals, right? But that they're definitely competing at a much, much higher level. And that them boys are the base. Because the last thing we want, and it happened here in Limerick, is that they were great under 21 side. They were great minor side. Isn't it such a pity that they didn't mm. want to, to play senior? It is really important now that, and I know Michael Dyden will do it because he's a fantastic person, that that... County board and group and county keep them players together and that they all go on. And um, when I say all go on, that they're given a chance and they're, that they're still there to play for Offaly in a couple of years' time. And if you do that, 
you got a chance. Yeah, agreed. Couldn't agree more with what both of you are saying. We'll and Jackie, ja- and Jackie, and ja- Rory, ja- by the way. Ja- yeah, I, actually, and Jackie, and just one small little point, uh, uh, just a very quick one, apologies. Like losing that last year's minor final in the cruel fashion that they did last minute, puck of the ball, puck of the ball from Tipperary. Like I remember a few commentators at the time saying some, in some ways this could be a blessing because, you know, lads can lose the run of themselves and get ahead of themselves. It's obviously driven them on. And loads of those kids, and they are kids. There's, there's about, I think there's six, six or seven of them, maybe even more underage again for another mm-hmm. two years. So I think that has had, a, like, you know the way they say you learn more from defeat than victory? I think the defeat has actually been of maybe more benefit to Offaly Hurling in the long run than maybe have what winning that All-Ireland final might have been. Yeah, and look, I mean, long may it continue because I think you're right. Watching them playing the Offaly style of hurling has been great to watch too. I think we're definitely going to come back to this because I think there's a whole other podcast to be dedicated on to just underage structures and how you mm. pull th- players through at some point. But we don't have time to get into that today. Uh, so Shane, we'll leave you off and thanks a million for joining us. Enjoy the matches and... Uh, don't be feeling under pressure now for Limerick this weekend. <laughs> Enjoy, the weekend. Enjoy, yeah. Enjoy the weekend. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, Shane. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses. All right, we're going to chat football. Eamon Fitzmaurice is with us now. And look, I, I think this is really, I suppose, where we get a sense check of what this new championship format yep. is going to be like, Eamon. And no better way to start it than with Kerry Mayo. How are you feeling about it? Yeah, really looking forward to Jackie. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of chat around, oh, there's still, you know, there's only one team going to miss out and everything else. But I think in the GA world, we're probably the best gang of all time for making sweeping judgments before things actually happen. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm just looking forward to seeing how, how it pans out. I think the big complaint we had for years was there wasn't enough of games in the summer. And... Uh, you know, I know from being involved with teams where you'd four or five week breaks in the middle of the summer, it it was it wasn't that enjoyable and it was very challenging. Uh, whereas now maybe we flipped it too much the other way, but time will tell. But uh, I, I I'm looking forward to seeing these games over the next couple of weeks, and I'm really looking forward to that game in Killarney on Saturday evening because obviously you're talking about the All Ireland champions and you're talking about this year's league champions who probably have been the most impressive team in the country up to losing in, in Roscommon. And ironically, that probably helps them and helps helps their tilt at, at the All-Ireland, which is what they what they really want. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's going to be, even with a bit of a safety net, I think it's going to be a huge game. I think it's interesting, Rory, because of the safety net, right? Because there's no doubt about it. Both of these teams want to beat each other. Kerry and Mayo, look, the rivalry. We've all been there. We've all been to Croke Park. We've watched this play out over the years. It's one of the best rivalries in Gaelic football. Yep. But because of the safety net, it's still actually meaningless. So Eamon is right. Yes, we do need to give this thing time. But actually, in a way, because they both know they're going to get out of this group, is there a bit of shadow boxing? Well, I... <laughs> I would have been of the very similar view about the meaningless football. And I've said this, and in fairness to Conor McKeown, I was listening to him on another on another platform over the last few days, Conor McKeown from The Independent. And he has slightly convinced me otherwise in that if you finish second or third, basically you'll end up having to play your last round robin game. You'll then play a preliminary quarter final the following week and you'll play a quarter final the following week after that. So you'll play three fairly high intensity, tough uh, tough matches where you're obviously going to pick up your niggles, knocks and injuries and that could then affect your ability to sustain that into a semi-final final when the air starts to get really thin. So I think he has convinced me too to a certain extent. Now at, on the flip side, you could maybe then also argue, look, these are teams with big panels and at that stage of the year three games in three weeks, is it such a big deal, particularly for Mayo when they've had six weeks off? So I'm not entirely sure. Like, like look, you, There's, I suppose, pros and cons to both. I think the key thing for this is it's just two teams, I think. I love watching. I just love watching both of them uh, for different reasons. And I think that's why everybody loves watching it, loves loves Kerry Mayo. I mean, when, okay, last year's last year's quarter final probably didn't fire. Even though I thought Mayo were in that game after about 50 minutes, I think Kerry pulled away in the end, Eamon, if I remember correctly. Like, that game was tight enough. It was played in poor conditions. And I think it was after the Arma um, Galway match, which I maybe had thrown the 
the preparation or the kilter somewhat, given the fact that the game, the previous game just seemed to go on and on and on and they didn't know what time their match was throwing in at. And I'd imagine that might have affected performance and atmosphere. But by and large, the games between these two counties, they're usually rip-roaring contests and I think we'll get the same on, on Saturday because... You know, look, Kerry at home in Killarney. We know what it's like, Jackie. We're going down there long enough and coming out with tails between our legs. So we know plenty about it. And I think, look, that's basically what Kerry will be saying to themselves, I would imagine, is that no one comes down here and beats us. And unfortunately, that is the case for most teams. The one thing I will say is I'd say, and I mentioned this before, it was mentioned a couple of times after the Clare match by Tyg Morley and by Shane Ryan, the goalkeeper, about the hiding that Kerry took above in Castlebar. And I think that will be in the back of Jack O'Connor's mind and the Kerry player's mind. And I don't think they'll be lacking in motivation for Saturday. Yeah. I don't think Kerry people ever lack in motivation when they're playing against Mayo Eamon. Yeah. He just, I don't know, there's something about this team. No, no, absolutely. Look, I mean, it's it's 10 weeks to the All-Ireland final from Sunday. So uh, it's, obviously, time, it's, t- it's, time, it's time to go, like really. 100%. Now, it? it's, yeah. it's, look, there's a huge... There's a huge amount of games to be played, which obviously changes it. But if you work 10, 10 weeks back from, let's say, the third Sunday in September, the usual space, you're talking about kind of early to mid-July. And, mm. you know, in the old format, that was that was time to go as well. So we're, we're in that space now. And look, as you mentioned there, Rory, whatever about... The, the public's perception maybe of the competition so far and there there possibly is that bit of apathy until we get to the knockout stages. If you're within a squad or you're within a team, you want to finish top because you want that weekend. If, if you're one of the big teams and your ultimate aim is to win the All-Ireland, that's going to help you by finishing top and having that weekend off at a critical stage of the year. If you don't and you lose your first game for whoever loses at the weekend, they're going to want to finish second because they're going to want their home uh, preliminary quarter final for the obvious reason of playing at home, but also not traveling and not being on the road that weekend. For, for a carrier, a Mayo, being on the road up to possibly Crow Park for another weekend, there's a bit of fatigue involved in that as well. So within the groups, I think there's going to be huge motivation. And, and besides, they're hugely competitive. There's a rivalry. That league game... Uh, wouldn't have stuck well in, in Kerry's craw at the time. Um, Mayo went on and won the league afterwards. Uh, Kevin Max is obviously going to want to see where they really are at now after a six week break. So there, there, I think there's a lot riding on it. I think it's going to be a great game, to be honest. Yeah, look, and I think after what they've done in the league and all that, I do think Mayo will feel that they're going on the right trajectory. What about Galway to Roan then, Eamon? Because I guess Galway, for a lot of people, maybe they were thinking this team finally have the tools to win an All-Ireland. How big of a statement do they need to make on the opening weekend to prove those credentials once again? I I think they'll be anxious to make a statement. Absolutely, Jackie. And they're at home, um, you know, in the league game. They they delivered a good performance to to win that league game in June um, back whenever that was on, I suppose, March maybe. Um, so they will. They absolutely. They're in a great. They're in a great position, and they're going to want to keep pushing on. Um, in the in the brief that Rory sent on to us yesterday, I saw two stats that kind of jumped out at me. One was that Galway are looking to win their eighth championship game in nine games. The only game that they lost is, is the All the, Ireland final. The All yeah. Ireland final. Wow. So that's that's a very that's a consistent group that are performing well at the at the top end. Uh, over the last whatever 12 plus months so they're going to want to keep that going and then on the flip side uh, the Tyrone I think they've only won one out of four championship games since they've been All-Ireland champions so they're going to have a huge appetite to 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 win and the thing about Tyrone they're so dangerous uh, they're such a dangerous opposition that they could be all over the place and the next thing they pull it together and they come and they could upset the whole thing. And they, they could beat Galway uh, uh, above in um, uh, Salt Hill on, on Saturday. But uh, the way Galway are going at the moment, they're, they're, they're serious and they're getting better and better. And look, the point has been made before and it's been made a, a good bit at the moment that the day that you get all of their big guns firing up front together, that you get Comer, Shane Welch and, you know, Ian Burke slash Rob Finnerty all 
performing at the top of their game that they're capable of putting up a score that will beat any team. That's modern day management, Rory, isn't it? You know, for Porrick Joyce, I think he's been pretty upfront about saying that is his biggest challenge. Yeah, and uh, trying to get the balance right, the mix right. They've got, I think they've got a really, like the, the type of player that they have in their front six should complement each other because they've got a range of players that are all really good at doing different types of roles. Now, it's probably a tricky one to marry because the the reality for me with Galway is they're a very defensive team. They are playing um, a near enough to an Ulster brand of football without being particularly Ulster-ish in terms of sitting back, trying to soak things up and then... You know, like I suppose they've got that ability with the likes of Comer, Finnerty, Burke, etc. up front to maybe transition really quickly and the ball will stick because though these guys are so good up in the, in that forward line. But I think look, they're they're at a they're at a really good stage in their development. I think he's added the likes of Peter Cook and John Mark coming in. Obviously Ian Burke coming back, I think has added a massive uh, couple of strings to their bow as well, deep in their panel. The likes of uh, uh, Killian McDade now has had a game under his belt, possibly the best player in the country last year, maybe with the safe exception of David Clifford for me. Um but you know, Tyrone are funny. I mean, Eamon mentioned it there. The the thing about Tyrone, and I've I, I actually heard this, and I thought it was a fantastic, and uh, it was a fantastic appraisal of Tyrone. Tyrone can lose a match, and they just does not get jot out of them. You know, they like, and it's very true. Like, you know the way, like, you know, at the, like, oh, geez, I've been on teams, you get beaten, and your head be you be as low as a snake's belly for 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 weeks. Whereas to one lose a match the following day, they could go out and they could just turn that form completely on its head. They have an incredible mental resolve, I'd say, and they have in uh, Con Kilpatrick and um, the two midfielders that they have, Kennedy and Kilpatrick, as good a midfield pairing as there is. And like, there's yeah, I if of all the Ulster teams that are left, and I know Derry were our defend back to back Ulster champions, Tyrone would be the one that, like, if I saw them coming down my path now, they'd be the one I'd be most wary of. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way, Eamon, which is funny because you know, look, okay, the Tyrone Monaghan game was probably the best game we had in Ulster this year, but then you've got a Derry Armagh Ulster final, yet everybody is still looking at Tyrone coming out of Ulster and thinking they're still the strongest team. Yeah, that, that that I was I was lucky enough to be at that Tyrone Monaghan game, and it was it was a brilliant game. And Tyrone were excellent in the first half, and obviously, um, you you know Monaghan played very well in the second half. Then and that that great last last minute goal from Ryan O'Toole, but it was a brilliant game of football. And as as Rory said, that might have knocked something out of other teams, but. Uh, Tyrone will come. They just have an unbelievable belief because they know their quality. They know that yeah. the quality of player they have is top class. Um, but they won't be happy with that stats that they've won one championship game uh, going back to the, the, the 21 All-Ireland final. That's not good enough for a team at that level. And I'm sure within their own group, they're going to be saying that. Uh, but like I, I think it remains to be seen if they're the best team that, that have come out of Ulster. I, I've been so impressed with, with Derry and what they've done this year and their awkward opposition and uh you know they're they're going to be very hard to beat so uh we uh, for me i'd be holding judgment on that one but mm. certainly this weekend um I, I i do think the way galway are going in the trajectory they're on they should be winning that game but if if tyrone turned up and tore the whole script up it wouldn't surprise me in the least yeah i don't think it would surprise anybody let me ask you about another Ulster team then, Eamon, because Donegal, like, nobody knows what's going on there. Nobody knows what kind of a Donegal performance we're going to get this weekend against Clare. I think, obviously, Clare are in a different path and and what may come with Colm Collins's team after the, the beating they took in the Munster final, who knows. But for Donegal, you just wonder how quickly they can manage to get a handle on things and maybe get a team out on the pitch who are ready to put a bit of pride back into the jersey because there's no doubt about it. It's been a really, really tough time to be a football fan from Donegal. It has. It has, Jackie. And I mean, the irony of it is that they had such a good win the first day of the league when they beat Kerry above there. And, you know, we saw these new young players for the first time and it looked like that they were going to uh, just move on from, you know, the Michael Murphy retirements and things like that. But since then, it's been the season from hell, uh, both on and off the pitch for them. And, uh, 
like look, the, the one thing I'd say about them is that when you're inside in that situation as as a player and as a management group, if there's a solid spirit within the group, it, it, it the conditions are there to hugely react. And you know that that age old siege mentality where the world is against us. It actually, regardless of what any sports psychologists or performance coaches or anyone else say, it is a very empowering thing that if you have this unity that the world is against us and uh, everyone thinks we're gone and everyone thinks we're useless and everything else, and you react, um, there can it it can be a very enjoyable place to the kind of uh, we'll prove everyone else wrong. But the only thing, I was expecting that from Donegal in the Ulster Championship because I think they still have loads of quality players, but I didn't really see evidence of it today against Down. So I, I, I think that if you're a Donegal player, they need to react this weekend. They need to react or otherwise there really is a spirit deficit in the group and there really is a lack of belief uh, because... It's back to the wall stuff. They're, they've had a bit of time to gather themselves. They've had a bit of time to do a bit of work. They have quality. It's time to move on from, oh, Michael Murphy's retired, Paddy McBrearty's injured. They still have loads of players. They need to they, they, they need to show their own supporters, really, and show their own families and their own clubs that the Donegal jersey means, means a lot to them. Um, but again, whether or not they will, we're, we're operating in a total vacuum with them. We don't know. We don't, I certainly don't know what's going on up there and we haven't seen them in a couple of weeks but um, they need to react they're, they're, they're too good to be where they are really that, that's kind of the way people feel about them Rory they're too good to be where they are like the fall off the cliff has been so rapid because they def- I know they've had those retirements but they definitely have the tools like they're a good football team is there Jackie is there is there similarities in the Watford hurling story and the Donegal football story um, in terms of, you know, teams potentially much better than what they've managed to deliver and the fall off and the, the fall off a cliff and farm has been stark and almost alarming to a certain extent. Um, I think from their perspective, I mean, the two results in the league, like the irony of ironies, like the two, two results they got in the league, as Eamon mentioned, were... Kerry and the two All Ireland finalists, they got up, they, they beat Kerry and they got a draw against Galway. Now, I know it's winter football and both of those matches were at home. One was in Bally Buffet. I think the Galway game was in Letterkenny. Like, if you can, I, I don't I don't care if it's winter football at that time of year. If you can eke out results like that against quality opposition, you have quality yourself. I think their problem for them this weekend, Eamon mentioned about the need to react. The problem for them is they're potentially coming up against a site that also needs to react because I think mm-hmm. Claire were and I'm sure they'll admit Colin Collins will admit this and the players will admit this themselves. I think Claire were very disappointing and they were ver- they should be very disappointed with themselves, with the with what they delivered in the Munster football final. I think they're at home. I think if you look, I mean, I know these are kind of silly sort of, you know, equations to make, but I thought Down dealt with um, Donegal quite comfortably in the end. I think Clare are a better side than Down. And um, uh, they're at, obviously, that game is at home as well. And I think, they, you know, look, I think there will be something on the line here for Colm Collins and Clare to try and You've got to win your home game if you want to make this last 12. That will definitely be a target. The Donegal game is probably their most likely chance of maybe getting two points on the board. And I think it could be a tricky one for Donegal. And if they lose this, then, you know, we see how quickly wheels can come off and things can start to spiral. The one thing is, Eamon, when you look at this group, Clare, Donegal, Monaghan and Derry, to me, this seems like maybe the tightest one to call because that third spot in the group you know, you just you look at some of the others and it does seem very obvious. So to me, this Claire Dunny goal game is absolutely crucial in deciding who's going to come out of this group. It's huge. And look, I mean, the, with the mini Ulster Championship that's going to take place in yeah. with the other teams, we know that anything can happen up there and the, the results can go in any direction. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, look, Claire are always awkward opposition in Cusick Park and they... Um, Again, they will be looking for a reaction and they will have been disappointed with the way they played against Kerry in the in the Munster final. And I, I think particularly maybe that they looked nervy and that 
they didn't handle the occasion that well, which is surprising for a team that have such high level experience at this stage and have been on the go. And I know they have new young players embedded and everything else, but you know, they they put it up to Dublin above and Crow Park this year and they've played plenty of big Munster Championship games against Kerry over the last couple of years as well. So they they will definitely be looking for a reaction. And I think all of these first first round games getting a result it kind of sets you up. You're almost saying, well, the very worst case scenario now we're in, we're probably going to get third, uh, but it kind of gets you going straight away. So um, it'll be, yeah, it, 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 it again, with Claire, I think they will react. They're at home with Donegal, we don't know. Mm, yeah, well, look, we'll find out. The other group game in group three between Sligo and Kildare. And look, they've had a bit of a rivalry, these two teams, yeah. over the last couple of weeks with the 20s and all that as well. And I heard Tony McEntee saying, you know, nothing has changed for them. Look, obviously they lost the provincial final. They were very disappointed with their performance, but nothing has really changed. You know, they get one win and they get out of here. And I do think, Eamon, if you're in Tony McEntee's shoes, this is the game that you're looking at and you're saying, if we can get a win here, everything changes for this group. Yeah, and that, I, I suppose that's their reward for getting to the... Connacht final, they, they're they in the Sam Maguire co- competition and their first game is at home and uh, look, I think Kildare, in fairness against Dublin in the Leinster Championship, they, they showed that they'd moved on from their indifferent league and that they showed that more, more of what we'd expect from Kildare with the calibre of player and the calibre of squad that they have um, from Sligo and in fairness to Tony McEntee, he was very open after that Connacht final that their target is to win one game in this group and prolong their season. Um, but I, I would worry for them, to be honest. I think they have a lot of good players and they have a lot of good players coming through, obviously, from that under-20 team as well. But it, it's, the, you know, it's just a different level at this stage and coming from Division 4 to try and beat teams that are so far ahead of you in the league rankings, it's going to be a big ask. And, uh, you know, what I what I would hope for the likes of Kildare and some of the other counties that are possibly boxing above their, their weight a bit in this competition is that they don't get three hammerings. And, yeah. you know, a lot of good work earlier in the season is, is undone. Yeah. Because the difference between football at this time of the year, maybe earlier in the year, whatever about the weather equalising it and everything else, other teams have gone to a different level. Like with the top teams, as we said, they're 10 weeks out from an All-Ireland final. We saw that with Dublin last weekend against Louth. We saw that with Kerry against Clare. We saw that with Galway against Sligo. They've all pushed on physically, especially. You can see that they're, you know, that they're, they're, they've gone up through the gears physically. And uh, I, I'd have a slight worry for the likes of, of, of Sligo. Um, and like I said, I think Kildare have turned the corner a bit. So it's an opportunity for Sligo, hundred percent, and it's great that they're there. But um, you are know. Sligo are Sligo the only Division Four team in the well? Like as are yeah. they aiming? They are, yeah, 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 yeah. They they are. Uh, Westmeath were in Division Three, mm. and Sligo obviously got promoted, but they started out the season yeah. in Division Four, and they were a very good Division Four team, and they had a great yeah. run of wins and everything but else. To the point you make, the quality of opposition that they would have been used to playing against, it's 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 jumping up, not just one notch, maybe a couple of notches, and that does make things like that makes things much more difficult for them, I suppose. It's a different ball game. It's a, at this stage of the season, it's a different ball game. So it's uh, I'd worry for them slightly, to be honest. Mm. The other thing, even Rory, if you if you look at the way the Talton Cup went last weekend all of the Division 3 teams beat the Division 4 teams. So if, if this competition is to follow that, you do imagine that exactly as Eamon says, the teams are at another level. This is exactly the way that the pattern should should follow. We just don't know because we don't know how any of these teams are coming into it and crucially how they react. Like it's very hard to come back after losing a game by 14 points to come out and feel like you're playing on, on a different level again just a couple of weeks later. Yeah, I think, yeah, and like the... the... But the Talgen Cup, I suppose, I mean, it's 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 going like it'll probably take a couple of years before we get some sort of betting in process to ascertain and appraise really, you know, how much of a disparity is between teams and because it will be by and large teams in Division Three and Division Four. Mm-hmm. If it's the case after four or five years, no team from Division Four ever even makes a final, for instance, then you know you potentially have another issue. But I suppose you can't really. 
make a definitive judgment on that until you develop some data. And as Eamon said, like, and I'm probably as guilty as anyone, Eamon, of jumping to conclusions around competition structures in advance of even giving them a chance. But I do think, you know, people can be quick to judge before you actually see the whole thing play out. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, you know, look, I think from Sligo's perspective, there is definitely an injection of, there is a feel good factor going around. They're doing the right things. Back to back Connacht titles at under twenty levels. Like I know they were unlucky last week in that under twenty final against Kildare, which had fifteen, sixteen thousand, I think, in Breffney Park. And um, you know, look, and I think Eamon made the point way back when you know when this lopsided draw happened in Connacht that maybe a Talchin Cup run might have been more beneficial to go to his point that three defeats and three heavy defeats might necessarily be great for their prospects long run. And look, does that then come back to maybe seeding certain draws if the provincial championships are going to remain in situ? But look, I think this weekend in terms of the Talchin Cup will definitely reveal a little bit more. I think the whole thing though is lost a little because I was looking there, I might've mentioned it on the email that I sent 30, 30 inter-county championship matches Crazy. this weekend. It is just beyond bonkers, Jackie. Yeah. Beyond bonkers. I was thinking that, Eamon, that like, I know the Talton Cup needs, it's, you know, look, it needs to be spotlighted and all that. And the games are massively important. But in the midst of a weekend like this, it feels to me like they're going to get completely lost. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's very hard for anyone to keep abreast. I think if you're just focused on your own county, Obviously, you'll be very zoomed in on them and you, you'll be able to concentrate on them for the couple of weeks or whatever. But if you're trying to keep an eye on the overall national picture, it's very hard to keep an eye on everything. Um, You know, there's some there's some great games going on in the Talton Cup again this weekend. Uh, the likes of one that caught my eye was the Lee Shaffley game because of the local yeah, rivalry be, there. Yeah. Um, you Antrim, know, so Antrim Wexford. I think Antrim Wexford will be an interesting one as well, Eamon And given Wexford, Wexford had a very good result last weekend. Sorry, big time, big time. And I just I saw the Leash um, Cavan game last weekend, and Cavan were absolutely the better team in the second half. But Leash really put it up to them in the first half. And you know, the controversial penalty call was kind of a, a key enough turning point in that game. Um, so the local rivalry with Offaly, the fact that Offaly uh, beat London last weekend and are in a good position, you know, it's 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 a big game, uh, and it's especially a big game locally for those two two, two counties. But I, I I'm not sure how much of a converse, conversation will be around this or how much can be shown of it, um, um, and so on. So it is it is challenging and. Look, again, like I said at the start, I, I think the one thing that this season is going to give all of us, whether we're uh, playing, managing, involved in the media, the covering, whether we're supporting our counties, uh, it's going to give us context. Yeah. And next year we can kind of say, well, that worked very well. That definitely needs to be tweaked. Or uh, as a supporter, I went to all those games last year Maybe this year I might pick and choose. Or do you know what? They were all brilliant games. I'll definitely go to all of them next year. So we, we'll we have context after the season, but uh, there certainly seems to be a lot going on every weekend. And then when you put other sports into the equation as well, um, it's it's hard to keep mm-hmm. abreast of everything. But even the organisation of the games, Jackie, you know, you've 30 games, 30 referees, right? That's like, I don't know how many linesmen and fourth officials and umpires and stewards and... Like, uh, I'd, I'd even question the whole, like, uh, look, I'm not casting any aspersions on the disciplinary process, right? But I, I, I was kind of wondering to myself, you know, these head-high tackles, for instance, in hurling, why aren't they sending anyone off? I was saying, maybe they haven't got time to actually deliver a due process across it. And this is, they're literally flying four sheets to the wind, week by week by week, you know, trying to get all these programs of games out there. It's 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 a quite the logistical challenge, I would imagine, for them, particularly now and and will be for the next three or four weeks. And it's going to be it's it's, it's yeah, it's, it, you couldn't keep up with all of it. Yeah, it's going to be helter skelter. Spare thought for the administrators. Spare thought for the Sunday game and the no, Saturday but, game producers yeah, yeah. who are trying to squeeze all those games into mm. three and four minute match edits as well. It is going to be frantic. But uh, we we'll spare thought to for you, all right, Jackie. But no one else will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is it, though, Jackie. I mean, like you know yourself, no, like having been involved there, knowing the first certainly. 
Like you, there's no way you're going to be able to do justice to the left no. amount. You, you just won't. It, no. It's impossible. And yet no. people will be giving out and complaining and this and that. Anyway. Yeah. Look, that's another podcast for another day. As well. <laughs> Trust me, we'll come back. We're to racking that them up. We've got a lot to cover. Yeah. Uh, lads, look, we'll leave it there. Have a great weekend. Enjoy all the matches. And look, I think you're both right. We're going to get a bit of context. We're going to get a sense of what this uh, competition is going to be look like. But uh, looking forward to it. Thanks a million for being with us, Eamon. No problem. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over.